Hey, this is Annie. And Samantha. And welcome to Stuff I Never Told You, a production of iHeart Radio. It's time for another female first, which means we are once again so happy to be joined, to have joining us, to be joined <laughs> by our good friend and coworker, Eves. Hi, Eves. Hi. Hi. Hey. Was that stumble over that based on the fact that you said that in passive voice or was that just like a way that you must say it? <laughs> it's interesting you say that because in high school, I had a very, very intense grammar teacher. And she was like well known throughout the school for making people cry. She was really strict and she hated the passive voice. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I catch myself writing in it mm-hmm. or doing it, even if I think sometimes it's not as big a deal as she made it out to be or that yeah. it's, it, it fits the situation, I hear Mrs. Ham's <laughs> voice in the back of my head. So it, it is a thing where clearly, I still get hung up on it. <laughs> I didn't mean to call you out on that. It's just, it was just that something that I noticed, you know, as a person who's an editor and, right. you know, thinks about grammar. Cause it's one of those things that never really mattered, like at all. Of right. course, it does actually make something a little bit more difficult to understand. But like, there are so many things that may matter on the page that shouldn't be staunch rules when we're just like speaking. <laughs> so yeah. I just like related. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> picked up on it. I I think about it every day because a part of this job is communicating and writing. And I'm always like, how can I write this and not the (laughs) passive voice? Which actually relates to kind of what I was going to ask before we get into this, because we've been talking about sororities and fraternities and all of this relates to the topic, to the woman we're going to discuss today. But I was curious how both of you, your college experiences were, how you kind of remember them. You don't have to go in depth, but you know, kind of on the surface. How was it for you? <laughs> I want Samantha to go first. Oh man, I was hoping you would go first. I was trying <laughs> to see because mine's boring. Like okay. I was super religious in college. So I did a lot of like religious things, including mission trips. And I really regret, not regret the people that I've met because I feel like I've met some really cool people. But if I had to do it over again, I would have made a few more mistakes. <laughs> so I, like I feel that. like I missed out mm-hmm. on a lot of that. I did tell my niece who just recently graduated college when she started, I was like, enjoy it. Truly enjoy it. Do what you want. And don't be afraid to do some mischievous, not illegal necessarily, but <laughs> mischievous things and make good friendships. But yeah, I, I was really boring. Not bad. Like we were talking some of the things that I had some flashbacks of going to Tate Center at the University of Georgia, which is where all the kids hung out or any of the organizations that try to recruit you or even our uh, college campus preachers who would just scream at people. That was where they hung out. So that's what I remember when we were talking about all of that. And of course, we were talking about sororities and trying to be recruited. That's where they hung out majority of the time. But yeah, very, very boring, essentially. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That didn't sound boring to me at all. I mean... I just, I, let me think. College was good. I don't know. I feel like it it was a lot different than my high school experience was coming out of high school, obviously, as it is for like many people. But I was like, I was a nerd and I've been a nerd and I'm still a nerd. So I was still that throughout college. But I did have a lot of fun. Like, you know, I spent, I was in Atlanta for most of my time. I was in Savannah for some of my time and, and in France for a very short time. But yeah, I had, a great time. I feel like I had a good schoolwork life balance, surprisingly. Like I was able to still have new experiences with my friends and meet new people and party and did make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so I trade like you that it. one, Samantha. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I enjoyed it. You know, I wouldn't do anything differently. I... I feel like the reason I chose Georgia Tech was a very foolish reason. It was mostly monetary, but the second thing was I thought it was in Atlanta, so I'd party a lot. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. I definitely party more now than I did then. (laughs) Um, (laughs) So I really enjoyed college because I also am a nerd and I love like reading and I love challenging points of view or Mm -hmm. um, just new ways of thinking that I encountered there, those like terrifying liberal new thoughts that you have. (laughs) 
But I hated homework and I still hate homework. <laughs> and so it was like, if I could just go to the class and have the dorm experience, that was amazing. <laughs> the homework experience was a nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <That is laughs> and so I also, funny. in high school, I didn't have to study. In college, it was like, oh, wow, here's a C. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> oh, no. yeah, for sure. <laughs> but yeah, I had some fun times and I actually started running for the first time again in over a year, which means I had to, I, I brought out my old playlist, my old exercise playlist. Mm -hmm. And so many of the songs on there were like songs I loved in college. Mm -hmm. I'd be walking on Skiles walkway and this song would be playing and it just brought back a lot of, a lot of those memories. Yeah. Yeah. I love those songs that you can pinpoint moments in time that they're related to and they become kind of like thematic songs in your life. But it's funny because yeah. I I was the opposite of you, Annie. I don't know. In college, I wasn't really. Yeah, but I was the opposite of you in terms of homework. I have a literal <laughs> VHS tape of me when I was a child in elementary school saying that I loved homework. Like when I don't, I don't remember what I was being interviewed for. I think I was in like some sort of play and somebody asked me like, Eves, what do you like? Or what do you like to do? And I was like, homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wow. So cute. <laughs> yeah, so I can't relate I, there. <laughs> I loved homework. I loved homework until college. Well, no, I loved it oh, in gotcha. elementary school and middle school. I hated it in high school and college. Gotcha. But yes, I would ask for extra math sheets because I loved doing all the calculations. <laughs> I see. So it, it morphed. It transformed somehow somewhere along the way. It did. It did. It, when the professors were like, read this three books tonight and your whole score, your whole GPA depends on the outcome <laughs> of this one test. <laughs> yeah. That was not good for me as uh, I had uh, nightmares about commas, mainly oh. because later in the like AP English and all of that, they're like, each comma mistake is 30 points. I'm like, what? What? <laughs> and I failed because of my one and a half comma mistakes. Still have nightmares about that. Oh, I think commas, I think we should relax about commas. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> That's the quotable from this episode. I think we should relax about commas. <laughs> I, that, that is a true belief that I hold. all relates to the person that we're talking about today, perhaps tangentially, but it does. So who did you bring for us to discuss today, Eve? Yeah, we have Lucy Diggs Slow. So she had a lot of firsts. Like she was a pioneer in many ways. And uh, she is related to what we were just talking about because she was in the education field in school. She was a teacher and she cared a lot about the education and development of girls and of Black girls and women specifically. So she has a lot of accomplishments. Like we could go down the list of all of the organizations and the civil and community and educational ventures, various ventures that she was involved in. But as far as first, she was the first dean of women at Howard University and so the dean of women was kind of this role where it was like student affairs for women, like counseling, discipline, and student experiences for the women students at the school. Um, she was also the first president of the National Association of College Women, and she was one of the founders of the Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority. So she is a big name in the early 1900s, and she did a lot in terms of pioneering when it came to education for girls and women in Black women specifically in the U.S. Yes. <laughs> also, tennis player. Also, <laughs> tennis player. How could I forget that? Yes, that is also one of our firsts that we'll get to. Tennis player. Yes. I played tennis for a few years in high school, too, speaking of. Um, was not did great you? at it. <laughs> so, I did, too. I and it, I, it was one of those things where my dad was like, he was really into tennis and he wanted me to really be into tennis. Mm -hmm. And I actually really enjoyed it, but I was yeah. also very bad. <laughs> yes. It is a fun sport. I've actually been wanting to play it again in yeah. recent years because it's, it's a pretty accessible, too. Like, you know, it doesn't cost that yeah. much to have a racket in their tennis courts in a lot of places. Yeah. Yeah, so I really suck at tennis. I tried 
because my all of my friends play, all of them played. And I am not great at sports outside of like, give me something to throw, sure. But I remember a dude who was flirting with me tried to teach me. I was so bad. He dropped his racket and walked off within the first 10 minutes. So I was like, oh, whoa. cool, 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 cool. So I never learned. <laughs> it's no good. That guy's no good. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen you play some Mario Party tennis with decent amount of success. <laughs> yes. We, give me a week. Yeah. Still have to have some wrist action there. <laughs> Sim- yeah. Similar motor skills happening. Maybe it's the aim where yeah. it just goes out of the tennis court with like the tall chain like fence. It doesn't matter how tall it is. I'll still get it out of there. You're <laughs> That's welcome. <impressive. laughs> So you're the person who makes the person have to leave the court every yeah. time. Uh, no, he was not wrong for quitting mm-hmm. and walking away. Like, yeah. There's nothing wrong with what he did. It was an absolute correct reaction. Yeah. So me and my friends used to, in high school, we would go at night at like 9 p.m. and there'd be no one there and we'd play what we called four court tennis. And it was some of the best exercise I've ever gotten in my life because basically the ball, as long as it was bouncing, it was still in play no matter where it was. <laughs> It was so fun. <laughs> that sounds tiring. But yeah, you had to, because you would hit it on like the four court, the opposite court. <laughs> the other person's got to run over there. It was awesome. Anyway, all right. Our tennis stories aside, shall we get into the story here? Yeah, let's do it. So Lucy Dick Slow, she was born July 4th, and there's some discrepancy over the date, whether that was 1883 or 1885, but she was born in Virginia. And she was the youngest of seven children. Her parents were Henry and Fanny Slow. They died when she was pretty young. So she went to live with an aunt in Lexington, Virginia. And in an autobiographical story, like a semi-autobiographical story of hers, she said that she was going to live with her aunt who, quote, didn't believe in playing in the mud or with boys or running up and down the road (laughs) was more than I could bear. So... There was a lot of talk of how her aunt was big on education and discipline. And you can kind of tell that in her story as well, because years later, she moved to Baltimore with her family. Apparently, her aunt wanted them to go there so that she would have a better education. So schools were segregated at the time. She went to Baltimore High School, and she was pretty competitive in school. She graduated as salutatorian. And she decided that she wanted to go to college. So using money that she got from scholarships and that she got from jobs that she worked, she was able to attend Howard University, which is an HBCU in D.C. that was established back in 1867. She was the first girl from Baltimore High to go to Howard and the first to get a scholarship. And she was super involved in things while she was at the university. Like this is another place where you can go down the list of things. She was involved in sports and in student organizations. And it was here where she was a founding member of AKA, which was the first national Greek sorority for Black women, which we talked about a little bit at the top. Um, And the tennis comes in here too, because she was also president of the Women's Tennis Club. And she graduated from Howard in 1908. So after graduating, she went back to Baltimore and she taught English at Baltimore High School. And she began teaching at a time when public school officials were really hiring Black people to teach Black students. And she once wrote that she she chose teaching the profession because she was happier in that profession than she was in any other profession. She had her own professional ambitions, but she still, she cared really deeply about the development of others and the roots that Black girls and Black women took in their careers and in their lives as well. So in 1915, she got a master's degree in English and comparative literature from Columbia University, and she began teaching at Armstrong Manual Training School in Washington, D.C. And she taught English at Armstrong for four years before she became the vice principal, which that job itself morphed into the position of dean of girls. So this title and the responsibilities that came along with it, they were highly regarded, and it prepared her for the positions that she would have in the future. Of course, all of this stuff, you can, you know, look at her history and see how one thing is building up to the next, you know, from teaching to dean um, and to like president of all these organizations and how all of her, her social consciousness, her interest in social justice and issues like 
racism and issues like education of Black women, all those things kind of aligned to create this very specific and like bright path that she followed. She also won the first women's national singles championship of the American Tennis Association in 1917. So she was good at it. <laughs> unlike me. Yes. Unlike, <laughs> no, I, was, I wasn't saying that for you. I was saying <laughs> us. Unlike us. Not just you, Eve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was really good at it. And so she was awarded in it. And uh, that was a pretty big spot in her first And in 1919, she became the principal of the first junior high school for Black students in D.C., which was Shaw. While she was there, she established a teacher development program. And as far as personally, like I said, there were also other issues that she was interested in. And she advocated for Black women who participated in the suffrage movement as well. That was something that she spoke out about. But back to her education. In 1922, she was appointed the first permanent dean of women at Howard University. She was also hired at the same time as a professor of English in the School of Education. And when she was hired, she sent a statement to the current president of the university laying out what the terms of her employment were. So those included that the salary for the two positions wouldn't be less than $3,200 and that all policies pertaining to women in the university would come from her office with the approval of the president. And there were some other terms that she laid out in that saying, did I get this right? Based on the conversation that we had, this is what the positions are going to look like for me. And she immediately became really active in the school and instituted things. She was also active in the city of D.C. within that educated Black middle class that she was also a part of. And she was immersed in the arts, uh, particularly dance and theater, She joined a literary club in the Du Bois Circle, which was a Black women's club that discussed things like arts and current events and other issues. And in 1923, she became the first president of the National Association of College Women, which was an organization of Black women and college graduates at liberal arts colleges and universities. And, you know, that this is also just in alignment with all the other things she was doing. So in the first statement that she gave... As part of that organization, she noted that it was formed to raise the standards in the colleges where Black women were educated and to make better conditions for Black women faculty and to encourage more advanced scholarship among women. And another thing that people have pointed out about her story is that she was involved in the church and she would sing in church choirs, but she was also sometimes a bit critical of the traditional Black church and the role that it played, and how Black women were affected by it. But um, she was really heavily involved in her community in many different facets. Like, And obviously, educational work is also community work. So she was, she just had her hands in so many, so many pots when it came to the cultures that she was invested in, education, the arts, and church. So she, yeah, she organized teas. <laughs> for women's dormitories. And she also gave an annual garden party at her home for the students. And But that's not to say that there wasn't any conflict during her time at the university. In 1926, Mordecai Johnson became the first Black president at Howard. And they c- kind of clashed from the beginning. So for instance, he would deny her request for pay raises, cut budgets for her, took her off of some of the councils, tried to get her to live on campus. Um, So they definitely butt heads over the time, but she stayed there until the time that she died. So she was there for quite a while um, and made a lot of changes while she was there. So women's education and leadership were things that were very important to her. There was a 1931 speech at the Teachers College at Columbia University, and I'll give you a quote from that speech. She said, In the first place, most college administrators must change their philosophy of education in reference to their women students. 
They must realize that whether they like it or not, the life that women are leading today is different from that which was led by their grandmothers. For this present day, life demands that women must be ready to make their contribution not only to the home, but also to the economic, political, and civic life of the communities. So it's clear that that was something that she was invested in herself and was really interested in leading other people to live that sort of life and recognize that things were changing. She advocated for the independence of women and for them branching out in terms of what they pursued in their courses of study. So all of these things were really merging in her story, and she helped found the National Council of Negro Women with Mary McLeod Bethune, and she served as the organization's first executive secretary. She was also interested in the peace movement and was a member of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. And it's the thing that, you know, people have talked about more in her story in terms of her companionship with Mary Burrell, who was a well-known teacher and playwright in D.C. Um, They lived together for the last 15 years of Lucy Digslow's life. And there was speculation that they were lovers. And yeah, she remained dean of women until she died in 1937 of some health complications. And she's had a bunch of things named after her, like a dorm at Howard and a boring machine, um, which makes sense based on her name, Lucy Diggs Slow. So this like lends itself to puns. (laughs) But um. She did so much during the time that she was alive in regards to education and the community work. And I think that her legacy really lives on. And people have acknowledged that in various ways when it comes to actually naming things after her and recognizing the work that she's done and trying to, you know, get things, making sure that we acknowledge the spaces that she was in and her house as historic places and her as a pioneer of the work that she was doing. Yeah. When you first sent the name, I was looking up like, okay, what, what's she all about? And it was just like so much, so much accomplished mm-hmm, in a relatively yeah. short amount of time. You can tell she had a passion and was just fighting for it. Yeah. And then really made some some changes. And <laughs> it was very impressive, very inspirational. Yeah, for sure. And and she's also part of this larger history too, when it comes to something like the AKA sorority history the history of Howard University and HBCUs. Like there is also this, looming is just like a a negative word, but like this overarching (laughs) history of Black people, of Black education, of women's education, and all of those other offshoots of the things that she was doing. She was wrapped up in that. And also Harlem Renaissance kind of leading into that too. So yeah, she she was definitely arts and culture. Like that was another element of the things she was interested in. So yeah, it's it, she touched a lot of points, and I think it's fascinating in that way where it's like we can learn so much just from the way she was moving and the things that she was interested in about the time and about the causes and the issues that people were concerned with and and how her upbringing led to that. Yeah, and also tennis. Um. And also tennis. I keep forgetting <laughs> about that sport. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's always impressive to me when people have those like two things that they're really good at that aren't correlated necessarily. <laughs> and you're like, wow. <laughs> it's like, how do you yeah. have the time? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is making me want to play tennis. I'll tell you that. It's I still have my old racket, but been a minute, so I think it might be a disaster. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I believe in you. Thank you, Eves. (laughs) Thank you. I need all the help I can get. (laughs) Yeah, is there anything else that you want to add before we wrap up? No, I think that's all. Okay, well, where can the good listeners find you, Eves? Y'all can find me at Eve's Jeffco on Twitter. I'm at Not Apologizing on Instagram. You can also listen to the show's This Day in History class, which is a daily show about people and events in history. You can listen to Unpopular, which is about people in history who really defied the status quo and were persecuted for it in some way and what their stories were. And yeah. And, and, and on Female First. Exactly. <laughs> and I think... 
I think this might have been our 25, our big 25. But I think we'll just say the next one is. So okay. that's the one. Yeah. We'll just make it up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We play hard and fast by our own rules here. <laughs> um, thank you so much as always for being here, Eves. Always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And, and thanks to the listeners. Please go check Eves out if you haven't already. You can email us if you would like at stephmediamomstuff at iheartmedia.com. You can find us on Twitter at momstuffpodcast or on Instagram at Stuff I'm Never Told You. Thanks as always to our super producer, Christina. Thank you, Christina. And thanks to you for listening. Stuff I Never Told You is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 